and thank you for coming along to today's lunch talk. Uh, my name's Martin Prouse. I work in the Independent Evaluation Unit as an evaluation specialist. As many of you know, the series of lunch talks promotes understanding of different evaluative methods and evaluation overall as a tool for learning and for accountability. And the title of today's event is Examining the Effectiveness of Adaptation and Forest Conservation Interventions, a Snapshot of Evidence Gap Maps, presented by Joe Puri and Solomon Asphal. So Joe is the head of the IU and Solomon is the unit's principal evaluation officer. And the aim of today's talk is to introduce a way of assessing knowledge gaps, which categorize and visualize what we know and what we don't know about key topics. Uh, the presentation will last around 25 minutes, which will leave around 30 minutes for questions and discussion, which will be moderated by Jenny Rieu, um, to my right here, uh, Agriculture and Food Security Senior Specialist in the Division of Mitigation and Adaptation. Um, the talk will be recorded and posted on the IU website, and we encourage you to participate, mainly, um, and also to, to tweet any responses you have using the IU's handle. Um, so I'll hand over to, to Joe and Solomon. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Janie, for being our uh, moderator and our discussant. And also thank you to Solomon uh, for, um, um, for also agreeing to do this, to do this two-in-one talk today. Um, so what I'm going to quickly go pa uh, do today in the first half of the 20 minutes that we do have is to run by uh, all of you what evidence we have in adaptation. How many of you have heard of evidence gap maps before? Hands up. Okay. How many of you have heard of systematic reviews? Okay, fantastic. So, um, I, before I start, I do want to say that this work is the joint effort. And if for those of you who know evidence gap maps, evidence gap maps require a lot of work. Um, you. Um, you come away a little underwhelmed, and I'm already giving you part of the story that I um, do want to tell. You come away a little bit underwhelmed primarily for one reason, that evidence gap maps are the start of a journey, and they're not the end. They're essentially telling you what evidence you have, what evidence you don't have, but they're not telling you what the evidence is telling you. Yeah? So essentially, you still have to do what's called a meta-analysis or a systematic review after the evidence review has been done. But I'm going to explain that a little bit. And I want to acknowledge um, a torrent of authors and co-authors on this study, including um, another colleague of mine at the Independent Evaluation Unit, Andres Royman, who should have been here but is missing in action. And, um, and, I also, and I also want to acknowledge that this work is uh, combined work with DBAL, which is the evaluation agency in Germany, and with AAE, uh, which is a um, group of uh, very highly qualified scientists who work, worked with us on this. Okay, so if my laptop only worked. Okay. Why did we choose adaptation? One of the things that we recognize with GCF is that, of course, the governing instrument says 50% of, of our overall portfolio should be de uh, dedicated to adaptation, or there should be a balance. Uh, but we also realized that we didn't know what was working, what wasn't working in adaptation. Internationally as well, if you look at the evidence, if you look at the amount of money that's being spent in adaptation, it's been increasing over time. We also looked at the Web of Science results for climate change adaptation, and that graph shows you the records per year, starting from 2000. Yeah? So that's just a very quick um, cue into why we started with this journey. This work proceeds actually, um, comes after, I beg your pardon, comes after work that was done by another group of scientists that were looking at well, can we say how, we wa how adaptation should be defined? And that was the big, big question that we had to deal with before we started to even look at evidence. Um, 
So while we were thinking about this, and I'll just come to the definition question, the evidence gap map essentially what was prompted because we wanted to answer the question, which adaptation, which adaptation measures are effective in increasing resilience and reducing climate risk? We also know that evidence is often scattered in this space, and so that's why we wanted to use what's called an evidence gap map. Now we come to the definition, and we tossed around and discussed a lot of definitions. I don't want you to read those graphics, but essentially the UNFCCC, the international working groups in this space, segregate and define and have redefined adaptation <coughs> depending on whether it is exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. The field has also moved forward then to think far more about vulnerability and potential impact, and I suspect that Janie um, and Martin will want to talk about this a little bit during Q&A as well. And increasingly, we are thinking about risk and hazards and increased uncertainty and how populations respond to this increased uncertainty and variability. Yeah? So there's a whole range of uh, definitions and therefore, as a result, typologies on what is being used to uh, define, and, uh, define and inform adaptation. And this was the big challenge we had when we were thinking about the um, evidence gap map. We then took away a few things to then define what we wanted to see from uh, this gap map, and I'll come to that. So the overall question was, what high quality evidence do we have about adaptation interventions? And what, do, what does it say about interventions and their effectiveness in helping people in low and middle income countries to adapt to climate change. So just to be clear, we were only looking and we are only looking at evidence in four adaptation interventions in low and middle income countries. So the first thing about an evidence search is that you have to define four things. You have to define who's the population, who's the affected or targeted population. And in our case, we were looking at humans, and we were looking at LMICs, right? Low and middle income countries. You then have to also define what is the intervention. So um, you want to understand what, is, what are the activities that you will be looking at the consequences of. So we define those as interventions that help to adjust, reduce, or stop benefits from a direct change in climate or a natural hazard. We also had to take a call on what we would call <coughs> high quality evidence. And if you've come to discussions that we've led previously at the IEU, we will very often and frequently use about the, uh, talk about the use of counterfactuals. Because counterfactuals help you identify whether the change can be attributed to the intervention or otherwise. So in this study, we wanted to look at studies that had counterfactuals. So what would have happened had the intervention not taken place. But we also realized that we'd be extremely limited if we only restricted ourselves to that. And in retrospect, that turned out to be a good decision because we expanded our search to include what are called quasi-experimental methods as well as qualitative methods. And last but not least, what you have to define is what is the outcome. So there's a mnemonic here, P-I-C-O, PICO. Population Intervention Comparator and Outcome. And the outcome was how humans respond to variability, extremes in climate, and whether they adapt or not. Um, so this is just a summary of basically what I said. Um, we had to define what were the study types, and we had to define what were filters. <clears throat> In terms of outcomes, so remember in the PICO, there is the last O is um, outcomes. Uh, we defined four overall outcomes that we were looking at. Uptake, shocks and stresses, and whether there was decreased exposure or increased exposure, or whether there was decreased or increased impact. Adaptive capacity of affected populations and the enabling environment. And in the in the menu of interventions and sectors, we looked at seven types of interventions. So the other big contribution of the study was to group all, all possible interventions in adaptation into seven groups. 
nature-based options, infrastructure, technology options, informational and or research, institutional, financial markets, and social and behavioral. So we basically, everything that could be taking place and had evidence on it, we grouped them under these. But we also had sectors. So for each one of these seven, we also had sectors. Overall, this is basically what is called um, a, um, a PRISMA diagram. We found globally from 2007 to, 2000, uh, to <coughs> 2018, 464 studies that met our criteria. And this is uh, the first study that we know that has looked at adaptation in such a comprehensive way for all low and, all low and middle income countries across all range of interventions. Yeah? So 464 studies essentially met our criteria for quality, for populations, for outcomes, and for, um, uh, and for targets. I don't need you to read this chart, but this is basically where I show off. Right? So this is the gap map. And what this is along the horizontal axis on top are the outcomes, and this is what we're going to discuss now. And then along the vertical axis are all the interventions. So all the, and the deeper the color, the greater the amount of evidence. The lighter or the absent the color, the lesser the amount of evidence. And this is high quality evidence. So what we essentially found is that forestry, fishing, and agriculture, not surprisingly, had the maximum incidence of high quality evidence. Yeah? Um, and um, yeah, we'll talk about it a little bit more. The second highest was essentially with respect to F F uh, forestry, fishing, and agriculture, but as they related to economic benefits. And again, this is not surprising because this is where evidence is most measurable and quantitative. Right? What was surprising was the amount of effort that is spent on creating enabling environments and the amount of effort and resources that are spent on policy, but we found very little robust evidence that we could take on board. So that column is almost empty. Enabling institutional policy factors, we don't know what can affect that or not, basically. <clears throat> so this is just a recap. Forestry, fisheries, and agriculture. And um, on uptake, we found the maximum incidence of evidence. Um, also with respect to economic benefits of these sectors, forestry, fishery, and agriculture but very little in water, which was surprising, and in uh, and institutional options. So water was the part that actually surprised me a lot because there are, again, water, there is the attribute that you can measure well and you can do, the, and you can do a lot of good quantitative work. Um, again, uh, in terms of regions where our evidence was distributed was um, what we had, uh, uh, what we did have ex ante hypotheses on, Sub-Saharan Africa, we had really good evidence on drought and food security. Asia and Pacific, most of the disaster risk reduction evidence and food security evidence was concentrated in uh, Asia and Pacific. But Latin America, we didn't find much. And this was the other surprise for us. Uh, and so this, was, this also then made us go back and look at our own search strategy. Because uh, as you can imagine, actually the search part took us almost 10 months, and Andreas can talk about that part as well. <coughs> in, terms of, um, in terms of countries, again, the parts weren't surprising. India, China, Ethiopia, Bangladesh basically showed the maximum incidence of adaptation, high quality adaptation related evidence <coughs> that we can use. So high quality meaning those that use counterfactuals, those that can be attributed to the intervention, those that are quantitative, and those that we think are robust in meeting the other econometric and statistical uh, quality standards that we had imposed. In all of this, only 20% of the 464 studies, so remember 464 studies does not mean that that's the only uh, pieces of evidence. Each study can be multi-site as well. And in our case, there were 664 such pieces of evidence that we were collecting. Only 20% used counterfactuals or uh, impact evaluation techniques. Um, yeah, this is the point I just made with respect to sectors and outcomes. Um, 
one thing that we found was that autonomous adaptation, autonomous adaptation, there is a huge policy need for it, but we're not finding, uh, finding a lot of evidence in this space. So one of the next steps that we are planning to pursue is to look at, well, what are the sectors that GCF is intervening in, and that's the intervention uh, heat map, but where and where can we inform it with evidence? Sorry, Martin, I'm almost done. This is my second last, third last slide. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not going to repeat this part because this is on ga ga gaps on concentration, but I did want to leave you with one thought. What did we learn? More evidence than we thought, but not enough. Great in agriculture, very, very little in water. What will be done next? We're going to be looking at what, um, producing evidence, in, especially in areas related to water and land-based ecosystems. We definitely require much more evidence for water and need to do meta-analysis um, for um, adoption studies in agriculture. I want to, th this is a far more disaggregated map, but I want to leave you with one thought. How many of you are thinking, well, why don't they just count the number of studies, see which ones have positive results and see which ones have negative results and just let us know whether adaptation works or not? That would be obvious, right? Exactly. So that's what is, that is called flat counting. And you don't want to do flat counting because flat counting does not account for quality issues. Yeah? So what the IEU will be focusing on, before I go on to that, <coughs> is that we will be looking at financial mechanisms in, in adaptation and what, and what a meta-analysis can show us. But the reason we don't do flag counting is because of this chart. This chart is a study on uh, crime rates and how they get affected by crime courts, whether they are effective or not. And it's what is called a forest plot. Each horizontal line is a single study. If you counted all these studies, there are 79 studies. I could count them and I could say, well, the line of unity on the right hand side it shows a positive result, that's how you read a forest chart, and on the left hand side it shows a negative result. That's basically what I want to know. But why you don't want to do that is because there are standard errors associated with each one of them, which means what is your degree of confidence in the result that you're finding. And unless you account for the statistical confidence that you have in these results, you should not be flat counting. In this meta-analysis, we actually <coughs> that oh, the authors actually found that the meta-analysis showed that the 79 studies, once all of the data was pooled, you did see a positive effect. And that, that little small circle with a very small line is essentially the key to this entire story. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> so I will uh, continue with this line of talk. This is a separate evidence gap map uh, we did with a different co-authors. I did not list their quarters, and Joe is a part of that evidence gap map on forestry uh, and forest conservation interventions. So what is the state of evidence base regarding the effectiveness of forest conservation intervention in the low and middle income country? I don't repeat some of what Joe already in indicated, but I will just try to give you why, why did we do this, right? It's obvious, GCF aim to support forest and land use projects within the framework of RED Plus, and we like to know uh, what kind of intervention have been implemented and how effective they are in terms of mapping those intervention uh, as Joe indicated. We don't go into the detail whether in terms of analyzing the, the impact of those intervention. This is a mapping of those intervention across different outcome indicators. So, uh, and also as a background information for this forest conservation intervention, there was a previous study done by International Initiative of Impact Evaluation, what we that is called 3IE. So our idea is to update that evidence gap map with a better framework and a little bit improved uh, methodology. So this one is an improved version. Uh, the one we did captured data from 2016 to 2018. The one 3IE did was from 1990 to 2016. So I'll present also a consolidated both 3IE vis-a-vis ours together uh, what the result says on that. So we use the PICO framework, as she indicated, the, the, <clears throat> the population intervention comparator outcome framework. 
So I think in this framework, as Joe indicated, what is critical is to have a very robust definition of the intervention we are looking at. That needs to be cl crystal cl clear and well defined so that you don't have double counting and, and the, the, there is a mutually exclusive intervention. We look at the intervention and that's a very important. We, uh, uh, the co-authors, uh, the authors did a very good or intensive job in trying to segregate the different type of intervention. So what is our population for this, uh, for this study? Our population is that it is the household, the communities, the companies that benefit from this forest conservation inter intervention, plus also uh, forest conservation ecosystem. It's an ecosystem plus uh, the people, that's the, the population. And our intervention is that I'd like to spend one minute on this. I don't know if that's vi visible. We have nine different broad categories of intervention. Uh, uh, that are well defined. There are conditional incentives like payment for environmental service. Uh, we do have protected areas that a lot of studies conducted on that. Local-based local conservation, uh, intergovernmental deforestation curbing regulation like uh, what was uh, practiced in, in Brazil, uh, that they, they would incentivize uh, uh, municipalities that deforest less, and they would also kind of uh, put a punitive measure for the municipality that, for, uh, that conduct more deforestation. And then we do have different kind of indirect conservation-based uh, uh, intervention as well. So we have nine major categories, and we have also disaggregated that uh, as much as possible when uh, that's possible. I think it's very important to understand the, the different type of intervention. And then we have a comparator, as Joe indicated, and then we have an outcome indicator. That's very important. So we have intervention, and they're affecting a certain outcome indicators. In, in this case, we have uh, outcome indicator uh, used as forest cover. That's one proxy we measure. We have biodiversity as outcome indicator. And another key indicator is the greenhouse gas emission, which is really linked to the red plus uh, using forest conservation as an instrument to reduce carbon for, for climate change uh, objectives. And we have employment as an outcome indicator, cost effectiveness and leakage. So we do have different outcome, outcome indicator. So we do have a, 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 we have a number of studies that are indicated there. If you Google about forest conserve inter intervention, there are many studies, gray literature, published literature. So we have to have a quality assessment criteria based on which we determine to consider a given article or not whether the article have used a very robust methodology uh, like experimental, quasi-experimental methodology, whether the paper or the study use a comparator or not, whether they account for a confounding factors, and whether also the conclusion they made is based on the data uh, and the results. So we did a very detailed uh, analysis of that. So based on that, we classify all the article into three tiers. The first tier is the, what we call the gold standard or very robust uh, I don't call it gold standard, but much more robust, uh, apply robust methodology, experimental and quasi-experimental methodology. Uh, for those who are interested in what these are, Joe or myself can explain more. And the second tier are those who use non-experimental methods, but, but had comparator. And the third study who doesn't use the first two methodology, but they use, uh, they, they define comparator, but provide a valuable uh, qualitative context and so on. So, all the, the, the evaluation we used, we classified based on these three, uh, three tiers. So this is the final outcome that we find. We start with about 2,500 uh, uh, articles based on the abstract and the title. Then based on rejection, uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria, we narrow down. And finally, we have about, uh, about 120 studies that we used for extracting <coughs> information from that. Note that these under 20 studies from 2016 until 2018, two and a half years. So uh, two things, I think Joe did not indicated this thing, I think which is very important also when we interpret evidence gap map. I think when we interpret the evidence gap map, these two indicators are very, the, very important. The first one is bias and what is implemented, right? If there are some project, forestry conservation project that have been implemented for over 100 years, 150 years, like protected areas, and it's not surprising to see a lot of evidence surrounding that, right? But there's some interventions that have been implemented since three decades, and you don't find a lot of evidence on that. So the disparity of different evidence is correlated with the number of years that project or intervention have been implemented, which is a very important point. 
And the second important point is also what we call the researcher or evaluation bias. There is a tendency for a researcher, for an evaluator, to focus on a certain type of intervention because it is attractive from a methodological point of view or they could publish it in a journal and so on. And also there is a tendency for researchers to cluster in a certain region and avoid uh, conflict areas. So then you end up with less evidence in those, in those, in those areas. I think these two bias are very important when we interpret uh, the evidence. And that, I think, applies to the adaptation also of this gap and also to, to this one. So what are some of the key stories that come out of the forestry? I think one thing that's interesting is, unlike in the case of adaptation, for the forestry, there is very less evidence in Africa. If you look at that map, uh, the more it's uh, shaded, the more it's darker, that means there, there are more evidence or there are more paper or studies that address or studied the effectiveness of this intervention. Especially in Central Africa, that's underrepresented. That's surprising given that Central Africa have the second uh, uh, tropical forest in the world. But despite that, there are less evidence. And this doesn't mean that the, the intervention have not been implemented, but as I indicated, maybe attributed to some of the research bias surrounding that, that region. So on the, on the other hand, we observed much more high prevalence of studies in Asia and Latin America. India and Nepal exhibit disproportionately higher uh, representation. And as expected, Brazil, Mexico, Ecuador, Peru have also well represented in terms of geographical distributions of uh, this, this evidence. And when you look at the types, the intervention, the distribution of the intervention, I think it's not that feasible, but don't worry, I'll just focus on the key story. And we, uh, overall, what, what comes out of this, this descriptive story is that there are no, not much evidence in most of the, the broader category of forest intervention. You look at the percentage of, uh, uh, of studies that looked at the different category of forest intervention, they are very minimal. The only primary focus what we observe is that there is more studies in protected areas and also community-based forest uh, management uh, relatively compared to the other. And the payment for environmental survey intervention is lagging behind despite the high visibility in conservation debates. And I think that's uh, uh, informative by itself. And another point is also in the distribution of outcomes, right? How, and these studies, what kind of outcome indicator did they, they, they look at? And a majority of this tier one and tier two, I'm presenting here a tier one and tier two, they looked at the forest cover as an outcome indicator. So the impact, the, the impact of conservation intervention on forest cover, about 57%. Livelihood impact out as, uh, 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 considered as outcome variable, very limited. And also I think one th interesting thing is that there are few studies about forest study that looked at environmental and social outcome simultaneously. That means we, then if you don't look at simultaneously, you cannot look at the trade-off between increasing the forest cover at an expense of livelihood outcome or enhancing livelihood outcomes <coughs> at a, an expense of uh, forest cover. I think that's another interesting story. And a very important story that there are only two percentage of this study that looked at greenhouse gas emission. So imagine if we promote Red Plus projects, uh, invest a lot of money, the primary goal is to use forest and land use for carbon sequestration and so on, and, and it's only two percentage of those studies that, that cover biodiversity and cost effectiveness as well is very, very limited. So this is uh, kind of bringing all together, as John indicated, so evidence gap map plots the, the outcome on the, uh, on the x-axis and the intervention on the vertical axis, and you don't need to look at it. This is what it looks like, generally as John indicated, right? So I, I mean, the first thing when you look at this kind of table is that you look at the, the, the empty sets, right? It plot outcome versus, uh, versus intervention, and you observe a lot of black space or empty space, which indicate that <coughs> there are no studies for most of the intervention across different outcome variable, and also when you look at different, different outcome variable. Here is the story. Out of the 50 evaluation we looked at it, there's only at one at cost effectiveness, one study at greenhouse gas emission, zero at employment, two studies looked at the, the leakage. So this evidence gap map, as I indicated, as indicated as for the two and a half year, 2016 to 2018. I apologize for my typo there, it's 2018. Uh, but then you might ask, this is two and a half years. This doesn't tell us a lot of story. And then what we did is we, we merged it together with the 3i evidence gap map with ours. 
and what we call a consolidated gap map. That's from 1990 to 2018. And the story did not change. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the story that when we aggregate both, there are about 129 evaluation study, and again, of those, only two studies looked at greenhouse gas emission, and two at employment for biodiversity, and there is a massive knowledge gap that looked at, at uh, uh, that we can observe from this gap. Okay, and I'm wrapping up, one, two slide. Uh, so in this evidence gap, we looked at briefly also at the, the impact of this intervention generally. I think there are three key features that I would like to display. When you look at protected areas, basically overwhelmingly, we observed that often protected areas have got a positive effect or impact on for, forest conservation impact or, or uh, when we look at forest cover, and, uh, which is uh, overwhelming evidence. But when you look at livelihood outcome, there's no conclusive evidence. Some studies indicated uh, positive, some study indicated negative, it's often ambiguous, when in fact it is positive, the magnitude of the impact is often numerically or very small. And lastly also, uh, in terms of leakage, this is a very important point also. You might invest a lot of money in conserving in a certain area, but then in another area there they might be deforesting. That's what we call leakage. And there are very few studies also that look at it, and which is very important to, to consider. Let me just wrap it up. Uh, implication, which might be interesting for us, is that for RED Plus, right? I mean, RED Plus is not an intervention. It's an umbrella name that combines multiple kind of uh, intervention that includes protected area or payment for environmental service, uh, enabling factors, policy, and so on. So it's quite difficult to really look at the effectiveness of RED Plus as an umbrella, but you could unpack it and look at that. But there is a study that was done by one of the quarter on a separate study, which she find that uh, <coughs> very interesting that in the case of RED Plus, uh, both carbon and forest cover outcome of RED Plus have been less studied compared to livelihood aspect. That's very interesting. This goes in contrary to what I presented before. So for the RED Plus project, what the evidence shows in, in our paper is that uh, they, there are more, more studies on the livelihood outcome compared to the greenhouse, and, which is an interesting. And so I think the key feature is that to what extent red plus intervention achieve for space uh, climate change mitigation remains uh, 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 a challenge, and that is for future uh, uh, work, and which also in our IU we try to kind of contribute to that through our uh, LORTA program, Learning Oriented Real-Time Impact Evaluation by uh, uh, bringing on board some of the Red Plus project uh, going forward as, as we go along. Thank you very much. So the, the rounds of questions will be, we, will be moderated now by, by Janie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe and Solomon. That was um, very interesting. and. Um, Maybe before taking some of uh, your questions, uh, I'm sure you have many, I'd just like to say a few, um, few words in terms of how that connects to some of the, of the work we're doing in uh, DMA on, on adaptation and also forest and land use, which is um, you know, the mitigation side at GCF. But, um, so that's, yeah, it's quite puzzling, some of those results, because we always um, ask for, for evidence. Um, which in many cases, that's one of the challenges in terms of having high quality proposal. Um, often there's not you know, necessarily the right level of, of evidence for a lot of the, both for the climate change, I mean the climate impacts, but as well as for the justification of the interventions that are proposed in the, uh, in the proposal. Um, so I think if, as a suggestion, would be great if, as you mentioned, this is the starting point, um, if this work can be somehow a little bit better aligned with GCF results areas, because some of the categorization are not exactly as we are uh, categorizing. Like for example, um, you know, well, agriculture was with forest, but land use was with build environment. So there's a bit of, you know, if it, so it can better kind of inform us if it's better aligned with the, uh, you know, the results areas in terms of intervention categories, uh, as well as for the investment criteria where with the outcomes because we do have also, uh, that's where we look at how they should perform in terms of the, you know, these projects uh, against our investment criteria. So if we could see as well what's the evidence in relation to, you know, to that, that would be also very useful. Um, 
we could somehow, you know, do kind of, I don't know, include some of these results into the, the GCF review uh, uh, process. And um, the other thing is that, yeah, we could, considering so many gaps, I mean, how can we make sure that also our projects are generating some of that knowledge that is missing? Um, you know, so that, of course, there's a cost to that monitoring and, you know, rigorously as you've, uh, you know, you've, you've explained. So how, you know, it would be good to know where, so water also, that's very surprising to me, but yeah, so that we could direct, we cannot do it in every project, but in which one, um, you know, those that are like missing for large scale that look at leakage or water. Or, so which one would be really added value for GCF, probably grant money to contribute to, to that, uh, you know, to that field. Um, and maybe, I don't know if it's worth it to look a little bit as the gray literature for some of these evidence, um, because maybe the scientific papers are not, are having a lot of gaps, but nonetheless for some where we are surprised, uh, because we know there's been quite a lot of work in these, you know, in these sectors, uh, maybe the gray literature could, could still be, um, yeah, could still be informative. So those are just kind of some reactions from my side, but I'll really uh, be happy to take some questions. And maybe we can take a few and you could react to the points as well that I've suggested. So I'll, I'll look for colleagues in the room. Oh, yeah, Bridget. Hi, um, hi Janie, my name is Bridget and I am, I really appreciate the talk. Thank you guys both very much. I just had two questions uh, on the second um, assessment. So the first one was, did you consider any non-governmental interventions, things like FSC and other kinds of NGO interventions that could potentially have forest impacts? And then my other question, I might have lost. <laughs> Um, so I guess I'll just stick with that first inter question. Thanks. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, so we'll take, I think, one or two more before uh, we let them respond. Yes, here. Okay, one Tim and one in the back. So maybe Tim first, and while you get the microphone. Okay. Um, so my, uh, I have two questions. One is just clarification, and that is, um, how many different uh, languages did you look at the studies in? And then um, the second one is more substantive, and it's about to what degree do you think these evidence gaps are due to um, just lack of, you know, lack of time or need to do more studies in those areas versus these are areas that are just really difficult to do a good quality evaluation in. You know, for example, um, greenhouse gas emission reductions require a, a uh, a really good uh, estimate of the baseline emissions. Um, policy and institutional uh, interventions are really hard to generate counterfactuals for. So what, to what degree is it the methods versus just a uh, lack of <coughs> studies? Thank you, Tim. And we'll take a, one last question there. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Emil. I work with the DCP. And uh, my question is about uh, I want to ask you what you think would be the role of the public institutional arrangement as well as uh, the regulatory framework t at uh, national level to enable countries to fill these gaps you have uh, spotted out in your research. Because I'm thinking this, trying to reconcile the work we are doing at the DCP assisting countries in their programming so that they may really develop uh, well-designed climate adaptation and mitigation plans. And uh, I was thinking if we would have a strategy to streamline these uh, gaps, the appropriate initiative at national level to cover this gap would be very effective and efficient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So over to you for responses. Thank you, Chair. So I also would, just before we start, we also want to acknowledge the fact that the forestry evidence gap map was, um, uh, was done with C4. Um, and so the rule that we basically use for these evidence gap maps is also to work very closely with thematic experts in this space, right? Um, 
Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention, and it relates very closely to what Janie asked, to relate it to GCF. So this is, pr this is n very little of this was actually shocking for me. What the interesting things that we are doing now is that we're looking at where are the gaps, but also where is the presence of evidence, and then overlaying it with a similar map, but where money is going in. Right? So where is GCF spending a lot of money in those cells? And also, where are other agencies spending a lot of money in those cells? So that's called sort of the heat map or the intervention heat map. And if you overlay it, the critical gap is actually where you find a lot of money going in, but very little evidence. And that's where it's almost unethical that we don't have evidence, but we continue to spend money. Because otherwise, the evidence gaps are just too huge for any single agency to take on, right? Or, so that's the next step that we want to do, especially for adaptation. Because think about the adaptation need. Yeah? The most recent study, UNFF, uh, UNEPFI, said $220 billion annual need for developing countries. So even if that was to be funded, where can we put it in so that our interventions are getting the maximum ba uh, bang per buck? And we don't know how to answer that question. So, Jenny, your point is well taken in terms of if you wanted to, if you asked to, if you asked me today and said, Joe, can you tell me what the evidence is for land use and built? We could parse it. We've we've tagged all our studies. If you asked us, um, yeah, can you give us disaggregated? All of that is available. The cool thing is that the next thing that we also want to do is just put it on our website. So you can all go hover over the gap map, find what the studies are, look at every cell, figure out what are the high quality studies, and do whatever assessment you want. Till we come up with the meta-analysis in the systematic review. And we'll put that up as well. But in terms of investment criteria, I think we're actually closer than you think to the investment criteria. Think about the investment criteria, paradigm shift potential, but impact potential. Yeah? What is the effectiveness of these interventions of the money that we are spending? Why isn't GCF doing more in understanding that? And so that is the challenge, I think, for us. We, that's one of the reasons we started with these gap maps, because we think it should be our responsibility as a public institution to be thinking about these things and about forcing the field and creating this field to think about evidence and having evidence-informed decision-making rather than eminence-informed decision-making, which is what the standard was in medicine. So in medicine, till good evidence in trials came around, you know, people sat in comfortable chairs and, you know, old-looking wizened doctors basically said, just listen to me, till the standard of the standard of evidence became do a randomized control trial. We have to push that field. And so it has to be our responsibility to create the field create. Um, on gray literature, my last rant about this is essentially to say that we did look at the gray literature, but gray literature is essentially what you find when you Google stuff, right? And we also know what fake news does to our thinking and how it twists and biases our, our own insights. So, we, I think it becomes even more important in today's age, as we are um, confronted with challenges of fake news and, and you know, absence of truths, et cetera, uh, for us to think about what is high quality evidence and what is that saying. Um, on languages, Tim, yes, in, uh, we, in adaptation at least, not in um, forestry, but in adaptation we looked at German, Spanish, and English. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop here. But I, I think that's essentially what I wanted to say. Just briefly, uh, <clears throat> I think let me respond to Tim. I think what, the, the evidence gap map exercise, we have not looked at the why, right? Why are some studies did not look at greenhouse gas emission? But I think Joe can talk a lot about that also. I think, as you indicated, a lot of two, it could be challenging methodologically. And, and often those who implement would like to have easy outs. They might not have somebody who advocate for that. Uh, but I think the key, the key issue that because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's not doable, right? Mm -hmm. If we think that outcome indicator in the greenhouse gas emission, especially in the climate change field now, is an important outcome to measure, then there need to be a resource allocated to that 
to advancing from a methodological point of view. There are a lot of emerging methodology now, and uh, and uh, that could contribute to that. And uh, you need to have a champion and an advocate and so on uh, that need to be looked at that. One question you indicated about the energy is like, uh, the way we classify it is not by who implemented it. Of course, there are many forest conservation interventions that are implemented by NGOs. But what the way we classify it is whether a paper that is published, be it being implemented by NGO or public or private sector, and what methodology they apply, and, and, and so on and so on. Definitely, in this list, there could be a project that is implemented by, by NGO. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe there's, there's other question. I, I just wanted to mention as well, there was a, a recent publication that Anya, the, uh, the MA Deputy Director, Adaptation Coordinator, has led with the adaptation team um, ahead of the, um, the adaptation week. Yeah. yeah. So this is just a start. I mean, but I think, yeah, there's much more to, you know, to be like, well, evidence, but also knowledge and just like what we're harvesting so far. and. Um, in relation to adaptation. And when I said great literature, I, I didn't mean the web, but more like, I don't know, final evaluation of the GEF, or, you know, they have work on biodiversity for, yeah. yeah the, maybe it's not enough rigorous for some of the counterfactual, but at least um, could give direction or, um, yeah, no, very good. I think maybe, um, I don't know if, Selena, because there's a bit of things, maybe if you want to mention, like, of the work, the recent works on um, these impact metrics, no? In a sense, um, we came to realize also some of the, the definition are quite vague at GCF, you know, what do we mean by, you know, even beneficiaries, <laughs> direct and indirect, uh, lifespan. So I don't know if you, you have things to share about that, just to, um, yeah, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> but I just no, it's, it's actually not so much to share, but I did actually have a question along those lines, but I don't want to jump the queue. I mean, I think I was looking with interest at some of the the common metrics that had been used in these studies, precisely because I think we're going through that process of thinking uh, beyond two, and you might say, rather simplistic metrics, particularly for adaptation that we currently use, tons and beneficiaries. How can we start to be more representative in terms of what we're measuring? That the question was actually, and it comes, comes to something Solomon just mentioned, in your experience, what is actually driving what these studies measure? And how are the users of that information? Is it the doers of the studies or the users of the information, or sometimes they're the same groups, who are driving that? Because you could easily see, you know, if you're a, if you're a government department in forestry, you're going to be probably more interested in the economic benefits of the activities and, and how you can report that to your government, etc. If you're a climate fund, you're interested in the climate dimension, but not a lot of others out there are potentially interested in the climate dimension. So hearing a bit more about that, I think, would be really interesting. Maybe let's take one or two more questions. Uh, yes, please. So, uh, Thank you. Um, so Hale uh, from OPM. Um, uh, my, mine is a more on the uh, on the level of uh, uh, these uh, terms because I I seen in the a recent summit also. Uh, the young girl from Swede, she used the slogan very effectively. Uh, it was protect, conserve, and fund. These were the three things. But I'm a little worried because if I go back in the 80s, uh, protection and conservation was in vogue. And that really r drove the whole forestry concept uh, more on the conservation side. But uh, Gradually, that was taken more like a policing by the public sector and having control over the forest, forestry sector, which did not work because there was a lot of things which were happening within this protection and conservation. So it gradually uh, went into forest management, for more from that aspect, where you bring in the community management and you bring in the services aspect, you, you bring in the uh, the the uh, the uh, the benefit of the forest from both from uh, 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 misuse and all those things. I'm I'm just trying to ri really if we get back into this uh, old hat of uh, conservation and protection, I'm, I fear that we are getting back to 70s and 80s, and this is a boomerang. If we go around and come back to the same old principles, I'll just stop here. Get your ideas on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soil. Uh, any last question, Andreas, or comment? 
No, a question for sure. <laughs> okay, my name. Sorry for that. My name is Andreas, also from the IU, also involved in this work, but very much And he's one of the co-authors on the adaptation study, one of so the if you ask a question... I, I still can, you know, just to uh, also go on to what Selina said, it's been very interesting for me as well to see that some of the areas are really not, are really not there, so we have absolute gaps next to the, to the synthesis gaps, right? So when we think about these absolute gaps in adaptation as well as in in, in the forestry paper and forest conservation paper. We obviously, you know, one surprise was the, the payment for ecosystem services for me from the forest side. And one, the other one was the surprise that there's really nothing in policy um, in institutional, uh, in the institutional uh, capacity from the adaptation side. And here my question would simply be to, to say, what can the GCF do in order to ensure that these things may be taken care of in the future. And I'm thinking along those lines, we have projects that obviously have an incredible amount of learning, and as we are a learning institution, what could we do with that? There may be opportunity for, for stronger evaluation design and evaluation setup. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm biased here, but, but yeah, so what can we do what, what, from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll... Uh We'll wrap up here, uh, give you the floor for responding to some of these comments and questions. Thank you. So should I come in? Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Selina and Andreas. Um, <laughs> um, so, and, oh, and Sohail. Yes, because I was going, actually going to refer to Sohail's question. But uh, just on you know, what GCF can do, and I think that's sort of the crux of what you're asking as well. Uh, but also what drives good evidence, right? And if you look at the evidence on what drives good evidence, um, there has been quite a bit of analysis, funders. Where money goes, funding follows. DFID came in in a very big way in the 1990s and just set the standard every time. Every time they funded a new institution said, we want to see good impact evaluations. And you can see the graph, and I can show it to you. There are two published studies on this. You can see the graph just go. Yeah? Funders determine what evidence and what the quality of evidence is. And this is the role for GCF. The GCF can come in and say, we're, going to, we're spending you know, $10 billion in, the next, in GCF1. We want really good evidence for every investment we make. Give us really good evidence. And we don't care whether it fails or not. But we need to know, and it's ethical for us to know, and to inform the global community whether things work or not. And if you set the standard, then we'll have a world that's far more informed. So that's one. Uh, I think also, and this relates to Tim's question, yes, methods drive where research is present, and uh, Solomon made this point as well. But again, who, you know, you go to scientists, scientists tend to do the things that they're most familiar with, and we have so much, so much experience with that. But what we're trying to do is also push scientists into new spaces, right? And so as funders, again, you can come in and say, okay, and say, okay we want to know what works in impact investing. Show us more. They'll follow. Scientists go where money goes. So uh, that's sort of the other thing as well. And I think we have to think of that far more proactively. So, Hill, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I'm actually quite familiar with that forestry literature on, literature on conservation and protection, and then it became joint forestry management, and then it became, and, but now that's why Red Plus and Co. benefits have become this big, um, you know, have become the zeitgeist. Primarily because it's been moving away from the exclusionary principle, which is what you do when you protect or you conserve and throw out people. Uh, to far more jointly managing and sharing of core benefits. And I, I, I think the evidence is saying that. So the systematic review is actually in the evidence gap map for the, one, for the topics that have examined this question do say that yes, they help. But again, they are, you know, the systematic review is 12 studies. We have to do better. Um, and Andreas, we'll talk by that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let me just respond finally uh, to what Selena indicated, and uh, we'll wrap it up. I'll just pick an example that we are trying to do in a, uh, in a lot of what drives what outcome variable to measure, right? That the researchers, that the funders 
who that the policymakers and there's a big debate whether the, whether it's from policy to evidence or from evidence to policy. What dictate the evaluation, the research question that need to be answered, and that's the crux of it. I think we like to change or contribute to that in the LOTA program now. Let me just give an example of Proeza project that's in Paraguay. The objective of that project is for forest conservation and, and livelihood. And I had a call the other day with, uh, we had a firm, a university who is helping out with this. And one outcome variable to measure on the impact of uh, this one. And uh, they indicated it's either to measure forest cover. And the something that came out to my mind is there's a lot of studies on forest cover. What we need now is to go into the livelihood and look at the trade-off, as I indicated. Is there a trade-off there? How can we tackle that? So in that PRESA project now, it's our job to push that agenda that, you know, inform the researcher, the academician, to also go beyond what is known and, and look at the outcome variables that are uh, that are useful for GCF to make to make uh, the decision and as Joe indicated, I think the leadership should come from us and we try to contribute that also here uh, through, through some of our program at IEU and bringing global thinkers and all uh, global researchers to go beyond the comfortable zone and measure uh, those that are that are useful for the policymaker or for uh, those who, who want to use those information to make uh, the decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a, that's a good final just to, to say how, I mean, to see how we can better kind of work together in a way because when we originate projects or, or review projects, there's a lot of space for suggesting, recommending, structuring to, to better include some of these, you know, uh, type of, um, to, to make sure the evidence will come out of, of those projects funded by GCF. So, yeah, so that's... Sorry, Jamie, yep. just to plug, but we now have a checklist as well that we've shared with DMA as well on what could contribute to quality design. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's good. We have to follow up on that. <laughs> Great, so I'll pass it over to Martin for the closing. Thank you. So did you, um, all, all that I can add at this point is to thank Solomon and Joe for great presentations, to thank Janie so much for moderating the questions, and to thank you all for participating with such excellent questions and for making it a really sort of vibrant and, and engaged um, discussion. Um, the very last thing I'll say is that the next lunchtime talk is on the 10th of October, October when we have Dr. Caroline Wiesner from the University of Bristol coming to give a talk on how complexity is a problem and a solution in the fight against climate change. And we hope that we'll, we'll see many of you then.